welcome to another episode of Unfinished Business Television. Um, I am your host, Jeffrey Galishaw, and with me as always is my co-host, Andre Joseph. Send the car. Uh, okay, <laughs> you know, of AJ <laughs> Epics Productions. But anytime you see a third window open, you know that means we have a special guest with us. This man was in one of my favorite action films of all time, Action Jackson. Oh, and a little film called Die Hard, um, as well as many other films and television, as he has worked as an actor all of his life, starting as a child well into adulthood, and in many television series and movies, sorry to repeat myself, I wrote this earlier, uh, not to mention is one of the rare actors to work with both of the ice rappers, Cube and Ice-T, in the same film as well as Bill Duke, Bruce Willis, Michael Landon, and many others. We are honored to have legendary actor Deborah Ray White, and thank you for being here, sir. You got it, man. DeVorier, by the way. DeVorier, it's all good. You're going to give me the hat. You're going to give me the hat, everybody. So we're all good. Andre's going to okay. give me the earphones. You give me the hat. Okay, I will find Stop a way to You have to talk about to Andre about his earphones. Those are his. I'll get them. I'll get them. They're on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> and that is how we pay our guests. <laughs> okay, plus tax. Plus tax. <laughs> tax and shipping. Exactly. We we'll do the prime thing. We'll just do the free delivery for a day. There you go. You got it. Yeah. You got it. What's happening, brothers? Good, What's man. Happening? Thanks for coming on. Good. Of course. Absolutely. Anything for Andre. It's all good. Thanks, man. Hey, Andre, you are the man. <laughs> I'm just here. So are you. So are you. So are you. I just have to hype it up with something. I know. <laughs> but no, Andre is the man. He's the technical support. He's the editor. So, you know, let's all give it up for Andre right now. Because <laughs> without him, none of this would be happening. So. Yeah, so, so Day, uh, again, thank you for coming on. This was a real honor with your long career. Um, as always, as I ask, like to ask all of our guests, what got you started in show business? Um, I was 10 years old and my mom had just passed away on Christmas. And so, um, a lady walked up to me on the street and I was going into a comic book store with uh, some friends of mine. And she just walked up. She said, do you want to be a movie star? And I said, what? And she said, do you want to be a movie star? I said, I don't know. So she gave me a card and, um, and she said, give this to your parents because you have a beautiful smile. I said, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. And I go home and I was living with my grandparents. My grandparent, my grandmother found the card in the washing machine in the jeans of, back jean of my, uh, back pocket of my jeans. I just woke up. And, um, and she said, what's this? And I said, some lady asked me if I wanted to be a movie star. And so she called the agent and I had an interview with the agent. And if you want to hear later about that or now, I can share with you or not. Oh, please, yeah, we'd like to hear about it. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny. Uh, so um, I walked into the the agent, and she was sitting there on like a throne with like her three midians around her. And I'm surprised she didn't have a crown on, like a queen. Anyway, she looked at me and she goes, "Come on in." And she was East Coast, uh, and and she was. Come on in. You ever did movie uh, any kind of acting before? She kind of sound like Mel Gibson. <laughs> I mean, um, Mel, Mel Brooks. <laughs> Mel Brooks. <laughs> and so um, I, I read for him for a movie that I commend um, uh, Dave Chappelle on. He got it. I mean, he it was offered to him. And so after me, uh, and so I um, walked into the agency. And she was like, okay, these are, this is a script. Have you ever seen this? I said, nope. Now, mind you, I was always really good in school. 
you know, with comprehension and reading. And so, um, and she goes, have you, have you ever seen sides? And I said, no. And she goes, okay, well, I need you to read these. And then he's going to read his part. So I said, all right, fine. So she gives me the sides, right? And I look at them. And like I said, I could always read good in school. So she said, action. So I went like this. Let's hit the South County cities of San Juan Capistrano, Dana Point, Laguel, and San Clemente in 2022. The actum inventory increase. And she said, go, go. And I said, there are no homes available right now, but this time they're starting at 1.5 million and da, 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 da. And then she just like looked at me and she said, all right, um, good luck. Good luck in the business. I said, okay. So I started walking out and, and I turned around because my grandparents had raised me a certain way. And I turned around and I go, Ma'am, I would just like to thank you for this opportunity, and I hope you have a wonderful day, and it was an absolute pleasure and an honor meeting you. And I leaned down, and I never took my eyes off hers, and I kissed her hand, and then I said, thank you again, and I started walking away, and she said, stop. And I turned around, and I said, yes, ma'am, and she goes, you go outside, wait, wait out there, and you, get his grandmother in here. So my grandmother came in and she goes, hello. And, and she goes, listen, I'm going to give it to you straight. Your son can't act worth beans. No. And my grandmother was like, I, I understand, you know, his mom just passed away and it was her dream. And she was a, a yeah, send my condolences. Anyway, he can't act worth beans. Now, this is what we're going to do. She goes, yes, ma'am. I'm going to do this, and I don't. I rarely do this. I'm going to send your son on three interviews. You see my fingers? Three interviews. And he must book one of those interviews, or we drop him from the agency. Do you understand? She goes, oh, yes, ma'am. I, I raised him well, and, and he'll be fine. And I booked all three. Wow. The Blues Brothers, a Mountain Dew commercial, and the Jeffersons. And it all started from there. Nice. Wow. <laughs> I mean, it was just like, it was, it, it kind of touches me now um, because I, now I'm the son, you know, all like my responsibility is to be the son my mother wanted me to be. And, um, you know, a lot of my early years was covering up the pain. You know, I was hurting inside, which affected me later. And I would just go like this. I would go, hello, I'm smiling. And if I can make you smile, everybody will be happy because I'm hurting because my mom passed away and, and I'm just a hurt little kid. And just everybody be happy so I don't have to feel it. It was kind of like that. So that's it. And then I just kept moving and moving and moving. Yeah, that's well, I mean just to have that start is really remarkable because a lot of people just, they freeze, you know, when they hear something like that, you know? Um, yeah. So did the Jeffersons come first before the Mountain Dew commercial or was it the other way around? It was the other way around. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. regarding the Jeffersons, because that was like really, I guess your first time on like a sitcom, like a TV show, and you got Sherman Helmsley, and you got all these stars from that series. Um, what was it like, just that experience to be on television like that for your, in the early part of your career? Like I said, I was always good at reading, and I had a, they say I'm a natural. I ended up studying later on. Uh, the experience was, my grandmother was like a rock, you know, she's the one that really helped me, you know, more energy, more energy, sweetheart. Okay, let's do it one more time. So at, at that age, you know, I was just, it was more of excitement because I didn't have the experience that I have today. So to answer your question, you know, it was a live audience. I just knew that Isabel Sanford, that they were big stars. I didn't know, really know. I think I knew who they were, 
I think I knew. Yeah, I think I knew who they were. Um, and it, it was just, it was like that. I just was excited as a, as a kid, you know, to be doing, it was all, I looked around and it was all just lights and, and people clapping and stuff like that. And, and that's also where I started to learn the other side of the camera, what they did as well. So as I grew up, you know, I learned what blocking was. I learned what, what a drip was. I learned what a script edit, uh, editor was. You know, I, I learned who the, what the director did. And so I learned all this stuff. And, you know, it was, uh, it's always been a great experience. So that's it on Jefferson's. <laughs> Um, was it uh, kind of the same experience when you were on your first movie set with the Blues Brothers and you have Ray Charles shooting at you? <laughs> um, yeah, it, by, by that time, you know, I, I just remember I kept getting jobs. There was, yeah, I just kept getting jobs. I remember when I went right over to the Blues Brothers that I just knew they were big. I didn't. No, I have a story for you, by the way. I, yeah. I didn't, um, <laughs> with the Blues Brothers, I, I just knew that they were big. Now, mind you, Ray Charles, I grew up in Baldwin Hills in LA. It's like the Black Beverly Hills, whatever you want to call it. It has that, that, that rep. And so, you know, Ray Charles lived down the street. Tina Turner lived three blocks up. Uh, Nancy Wilson lived two blocks when I'd walk home from school. You know, so it was, uh, you know, that that's how it was. So when I got to the set, I'll tell you a little story. When I got to the set on Blues Brothers, you know, you, you must have three hours of school about the state. You know, it's, it's mandated, it's mandatory that you have that. And so, um, you know, I'm in, I, in, in school and it's time to go to lunch. And so... John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd, John Belushi, I just saw him always playing tricks and jokes and stuff on the set with people. And so it made me, it was funny to me. And he he said to me, yeah, kid, you want to go to lunch with us? And I was like, sure. So now I will say again, when you're supposed to have three hours of school, you know, I leave for lunch and you have like an hour. An hour they it's it's pushing it with an hour depending on if they want to start filming soon so i went with them and he put me on his shoulders because i was so little i was always very little he put me on his shoulders and we're walking around and the tour bus is like ladies and gentlemen there's the blues brothers dan Aykroyd and john belushi and the people on the tour bus are yeah and so I'm like, wow. So we're going all over Universal Studios. You know, each took me where the Jaws was, the shark and the saloon and the ghost town and, and all this stuff. And it was great. Star Wars, all that stuff, it was great. And so we get back about two hours, two and a half hours later. And so the producer is running up. John Landis is running up and... Um, and the, the director, I mean, um, the teacher, the school teacher, they're running up and, and I'm looking and looking at them and, and they go, Mr. Belushi, he has three hours of schooling and for lunch, he's only has to be max an hour. And you know, we, the state, we need to have him in school. And can I say this word on this interview that he yeah, said? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. And so um, he looked at them and he goes, that school. He learned more with us than any of that fucking school could ever teach him. Fuck that school and walked off and he goes, hope you had a good time, kid. Fuck that school. And they just like looked and the teacher was like, wow. And I was like, <laughs> well, he was right, you know? <laughs> On a movie set. I was like, That was fun. That was fun, man. I believe it. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it, the business is just, everybody has their own journey, you know, and, and their own experiences. So 
you know, as a, as a child, it was, I, I just knew that I was going to work. It's like, I'd be sitting in class and the teacher's aide would walk in and I knew that I could look and I said, great, I'm out of here. You know, I'm going for an interview or I'm going to work, I'm going to Mississippi or I'm going to New York or, you know, I'm going somewhere. And um, so, you know, that's it as a child actor, that's what we do. So just to reiterate, you had no formal training. It was just your grandparents really pushed you and helped you with your work, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I worked at Dozeldorf, you know, the the Harry Potter, you know, me and Harry. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, no, I was a natural. Um, I had no training. I was I learned, you know, gradually. You know, my grandmother would be like, okay, look up. Okay, look at that person over there. Okay, she, she was uh, teaching me how to, how to block me. And she was like, hey, look over there. And, and she would go and smile. And this one, you look kind of sad. So I just learned. They just said I was a natural, man. I, you know, that's it. Oh, that's Diar, you know, we were, we ad-libbed. So we'll get to that, I guess. Yeah, yeah, we'll eventually, we got a lot of questions about Die Hard for sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm so, I'm sore. I've been working out at the gym. I'm really, really sore. My arms, it's all good. Oh. Yeah, don't worry, I know the feeling. Oh. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> See those gains, man? Yeah, man, I mean... Dude, maybe well, I was gonna make a Die Hard Six thing, but no, we're, we're not gonna go there. Right now. <laughs> Wait till we get to that section. Yeah, we'll. <laughs> um, I also know you did not one but multiple appearances on Little House on the Prairie, and you played multiple different parts. What was that like? Like I said, I was just a kid running around. You know, um, a lot of my childhood. I'm not gonna say I missed out on. It, it was just, I, I knew I had to go to work and I knew that I was out of my regular school, dude. So, and, and I, Little House on the Prairie, I played, I believe I played the same character. He was one of the blind okay. kids. And I just, you know, they kept asking me to return, to return. So I was one of the blind kids on there. Uh, and it was a trip because they wanted me to be blind. So I just, did what I thought a blind person would do and just would walk around like that. And they were, it was good. They, I mean, it was good for them. You know, they were good with it. So like I said, just natural stuff. Learned a lot. I learned a lot as a kid. So. Uh, um, interesting since you were on Little House on the Prairie and Highway to Heaven, when you uh, guest star on Highway to Heaven, did Michael Landon remember you? you know, or like, did he suggest you be cast in that role? Nope. I would no. go in, see what, what happens is I was getting, the resume was building, right? The mm -hmm. resume was building, giving you guys a little light here. The resume, makeup! <laughs> <laughs> the resume was building. And so I would go in and it was like when my agent first signed me, you know, you, you there's a process, you know, you go in and you're, you guys are aware of it. Then you get a call back and then you go in, then you get a call back and then you go in and then sometimes it's another call back or you get the job after the first call back. So, um, you know, when it got to that point, you know, I remember going in for casting and then they asked me to come back and then they broke it down. And so they, they chose me, you know, I had the honor of being chosen. So a lot of the jobs were like that when I was a kid, you know, that's the whole, that's how it is. It's changed now. However, that was ultimately that, that was ultimately it with, uh, with that stuff. Hmm. Uh, was it the kind of the same experience when you uh, had one of your first movie roles places in the heart where you're kind of, your act is the catalyst for the rest of the movie. <laughs> yeah, with with then it was it was Robert Benton. 
who was an awesome director because you know he and the Meryl Streep relationship was awesome and he had won for all these this stuff I knew that and I knew Arlene Donovan was a, a big producer I I knew that and I was like 18 19 and so I'm ageless now so <laughs> yeah. yeah so I went in and I read they sent me straight to producer. Sometimes they'll do that, depending on your resume. And um, they sent me, by that time I built up a substantial amount of work. And so they sent me straight to them. I read for them. And then they called me back and I read for them. And then they lived in New York. So then they called me to come and do a final callback in New York. So they flew me to New York, and I just remember there was this room with this huge round table, and just those two and myself with the table between us. They were at distance. And so I read it again, and by the time I got home, I was booked. Oh, wow. So that's yeah. how that process worked, you know? And, uh, and today, I'm, it's an honor to have that on my resume. And that movie was the reason I got Die Hard, which we will go up to, we will go after further, right? Yeah, at some point, <laughs> because I did read about that, that that performance is what got you to Roll of Argyle. So that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but there was some other TV stuff you did in between yeah. that, that I want to ask you about. Uh, more specifically, sure. a movie that Jeff and I reviewed a few years ago called <laughs> The Children of Times Square, which aired on ABC. A favorite of ours on this show. <laughs> um, how did you prepare for that role? What was it like working with Curtis Hansen before he became, you know, the L.A. confidential eight mile filmmaker that everybody reveres? Um, it, it was cool. I remember I went straight to producer for that. I believe I was at NBC and uh, and and I just booked it. I went in, met with. Uh, met with producer and just next thing I knew I had it and flew to New York and was in Times Square. And that's when I had the honor of meeting uh, Howard Rollins who mm. later became like a mentor and like an uncle to me, just wow. a cool dude, cool dude. Yeah, I was gonna ask, working with him, was he as intimidating off camera as he was in the film or was he really warm? He, he was, I remember it now, it's all coming back to me. Yeah, he was uh, evil in the movie and I remember he treated us, treated us horribly. Yeah, he was so cool. He was so nice, dude. He would laugh with the, and he was so, um, so trained so well internally and method, which I found out later what method was that he, we all get this, this, uh, our own get down, our own like treasure box. And so he could turn it off and turn it on, you know, turn it off on set, turn it on on camera. Mm -hmm. Now, some actors, you know, we'll get to that in Die Hard, they become the character and the character becomes you. And so they stay in character. That's why so many actors are so crazy because they play so many different parts and they don't know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> I've dealt with a few, so I know. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure you have. I'm sure you have, man. <laughs> and then there's always the question Jeff and I like to ask, but um, you worked with Larry B. Scott in that film. Do you mm -hmm. still talk to Larry B. Scott? Because we'd be trying to get him on this show. <laughs> I haven't spoken to Larry in years. Mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. not spoken. And I think about him from time to time. I'm going to reach out to him, though. Yeah, no, we appreciate it. Because, I mean, he, he's like one of these guys. We see, like, all these films with Karate Kid and Children of the Times Square. And I feel like he's got so much knowledge from all those mm -hmm. films that we'd love to have him on and talk to him at some point. <laughs> Yeah, I used to run around with him and, um, you know, he's a good actor. He's a really good actor. And so, yeah, we, we uh, were friends, you know, we're friends. I just haven't spoken with him for a while. I'm going to reach out to him. Oh, thank cool. you. Appreciate it. Um, I have to say, with Children of Times Square, this is the start that I noticed with all your acting roles, 
the wardrobe is so sharp and stylish. And I was just wondering, is that something you like put in contracts or is that just something natural? They were like, hey, here's a young hip guy. So we got to make sure his threads are sharp. Because I know like one of the big things in that movie is that Larry B. Scott wants this uh, leather jacket that uh, Howard Rollins has. But I'm like looking at your character and I'm like, he's got sharper threads in the background. <laughs> you just go to him. <laughs> so I just no. always wanted to noted that about your career was like I was always like damn I want that outfit just like how you're asking me for mine I'm like damn I wish I could wear that (laughs) you could not ever have too many badass clothes exactly (laughs) no um, on the real on the real though he um with wardrobe they, they just dressed me according to the character and when I got to head of the class in Die Hard we'll talk about the wardrobe stuff Mm-hmm. Okay. Awesome. Um, I'm just yeah. sorry, Andre. Just one more question. What was it like filming in Times Square back in the, I guess, pre Giuliani yeah. kind of dark <laughs> days of Times Square? Uh, it was just busy. New York was busy. I ended up living in New York for a while after that. New York has always been busy, you know, and as a kid like that, you know, I just looked at the lights and stuff and looked at all the cars, you know, and the, the cabs and, and just saw how busy it was. It was another job where I was just a kid and I was just excited. You know, there was no correlation or chemistry with my character that was involved within my surroundings at all. If there were, it just was attributed to me just you know, being a kid at that age, you're bouncing around, you know, you're having fun. And I only had school for three hours. It was cake. (laughs) I can imagine. (laughs) Um, I want to also bring up, you you did an appearance on the show Stingray with Nick Mancuso, who actually I know personally and hope to have him on the show. He's dealing with some health issues right now. But the episode you did, you were like a troubled high school kid alongside Miguel Nunez Jr. and Mm -hmm. David Rayner, who directed another movie we reviewed called Trippin' a while back. Mm -hmm. Um, You guys shot that in Canada, from what I understand, because I think that was where all the stuff for Stingray was done. Yeah. Yeah, they flew me to Canada. And that was my first time in Canada. I ended up doing other projects there. However, it was Canada. It sure was. It was cold. I loved it. It's Vancouver. It's clean, as it has a reputation for. Loved it. Just another location. Yeah, I hope to get around there one day. Um, And also, that episode had Kareem Abdul-Jabbar at the end for a cameo. Was his part shot separate, or did you guys actually get to be on set with him? Uh, I'm pretty sure it was separate. Okay. He was separate, yeah, because he wasn't with us up there. Because that's one thing I would remember. Yeah, because that that would have been a kind of a cool experience to have. But still, it worked for the episode with how you guys kind of get redeemed at the end. So I I really like that. Yeah, yeah. I remember seeing him and I was like, oh, really? So yeah, it was definitely separate, which Mm -hmm. they do sometimes a lot. Right. Um, So we were trying to rewatch Axton Jackson the other day because that's another one of like our guilty pleasures. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't find your character in the film. Who did you play exactly? In Axton Jackson? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was filming Die Hard. And then in the middle of Die Hard, Joel Silver said, um, yeah, I want you to jump over and because he was doing Action Jackson. And he said, I, I want you to jump over there and do a couple of lines. I was like, sure, I'll do it. Fine. So, you know, he was just the, the valet. I forgot his name. He was, um, well, you guys can find him, I'm sure. Yeah, was, Clovis is the name of the character. That was it. Clovis, that's it, that's it. Clovis is so funny because, you know, I had Argyle and then he yeah. did Clovis. And he did this stuff, not me, because I think he wanted to take it away from the stereotypical view in his eyes and give me names that were kind of authentic. Oh, okay. Nice. So, yeah, that was fun. And we did the line, the, the, the little scene right on spec like 
He just sh- sent me over there, gave me the lines and Carl Weathers. I knew who he was. And I was just, yeah, cool. So that was it. That was it. Awesome. Yeah. Are there any roles around this time that maybe you auditioned for and didn't get or that you regret you didn't get? Hmm. Well, I have a story for you with, with Dave Chappelle and myself. I was, nope. uh, it was Mel Brooks, and I knew who Mel Brooks was. Lee Daniels was managing me at that time. And so Mel Brooks was doing a film, and the name of it was called Men in Tights. Yeah. Robin Hood, Men in Tights. And so um, he sends me straight to Mel Brooks. And I remember this at Raleigh Studios, I remember this beautiful office. It like had these mahogany counters and it had a bar and and I, I didn't start drinking yet though. And you know, it was it was just amazing. The couches and, and I walked in and, and he was sitting there in this this leather chair and it was really cool. And I think he was smoking a cigar, I'm not sure. And so um he said, Yeah, how, how you doing? I said, Hello, Mr. Brooks. And and he directed me, you know, and I'm like having Mel Brooks direct me in a film. That's beautiful. And so he directed me and, you know, I did the lines and did the dialogue and, and it was cool. He directed me. And then that was, that was the interview. And Lee had said, okay, how did you do? And I said, I felt I did good. And so, <laughs> so Mel Brooks, um, called him and Lee calls me and says, I got Mel Brooks, you know, he just called me and we need to call him back and I want you on the line. And I said, okay. And so he calls him back and I'm on the line with Lee and he, Lee goes, uh, Mr. Brooks, it's Lee. And he goes, yeah, I think Lee knew him or something. And he goes, he goes, yeah, Lee, uh, you know, I've been sitting here and you know, I'm thinking about this. I'm really thinking about this. And he said, okay, I've got this kid, this guy, and his name is Dave Chappelle, and he's a stand-up comic. And then I've got DeVorier, who, and he said my name correctly, by the way. He said, mm-hmm. maybe. He goes, I've got DeVorier, and, you know, and he he's good. You know, he was good in everything. He took the direction and blocking very well. Now, Lee, what, what do I do about this? And Lee goes, well, with all due respect, he goes, uh, Dave Chappelle is a stand-up comic, and he's funny. Uh, I'm not sure if he has the experience of being an actor, though, off the comedic stage platform. He said, the has, you know, worked with Ray Charles, he's worked with, you know, all of these other actors and he's grown up in the business and he understands, you know, what direction is, what blocking is, you know, what rehearsals, what dress rehearsal is and set calls, set times. And he went down the list. He goes, the director, the producer, the sound person, you know, uh, all that stuff he went over and he goes, so that's what DeVore is growing up with. So, you know, it, it's up to you, you know, Mr. Brooks. And there was a pause and then he goes, hmm. And he goes, so what does he have that the other one doesn't have? And he said, well, I, that's what I just explained to you. And he goes, so how much are we talking? And he goes, Lee paused. And he goes, I, I don't talk about money because it's classless to me. Sure. And it, it's just, it's, it, it's not, it, it's, it's not cool as far as, as far as I'm concerned. So I'll say this. He, Lee said, well, respectfully, because of Die Hard and because he's, go- this was in between Die Hard and Trespass. He goes, well, He's, he's diehard, which you're aware of. He goes, yeah, I am. And he goes, and he's going to be on his way to Atlanta in Memphis, Tennessee, because he's co-starring in a role with Walter Hill, who's one of, like my uncle, by the way, Walter Hill. And he goes, he's going to be flying out and going to uh, co-star in a film 
with Ice-T, Ice Cube, and uh, Adam Sandler, and back um, Bill, Pre um, Bill Paxton. And he goes, so we need you to respectfully come in with this. Respectfully to start, come in with this. And there was a long pause, and then all of a sudden, you hear Mel Brooks go, <laughs> and he hung up. Wow. And so, Jeez. you know, that we were talking about if I was ever re rejected or anything, and he hung up. And so Lee was like, you know, that's Lee. He goes, he, Lee would always talk a certain way. You know, he'd go, the voyeur baby. It's okay, baby. You you you're gonna be a star. He goes. You're on your way to to work with um you know all these people in in Atlanta anyway. You know you're working with Cube and T and he goes, honey, just don't worry about it. We just we'll get you to the airport and that's okay. I was like, okay. And he had, had us call him Big Papa. Okay, Big Papa, Big Daddy. That's what it was, Big Daddy. <laughs> and so I was cool. What was amazing to me and I he will always be in my heart. I was watching Entertainment Tonight when they were filming Men in Tights. And they asked Dave Chappelle, uh, they said, okay, we we see, you know, everybody's filming around here and everybody, some people look very funny. And, and he goes, how do, you, how do you like filming? And he goes, well, you know, it's great to work with, uh, with Mel Brooks. And he goes, you know, and I thank DeVoyer White because he passed on the role and I'm just blessed to be here. When I saw that, I went, wow, that's called respect. That's called respect. And um, and I just said, he gave me props and that was cool. And so, you know, that's how that situation went. <laughs> when you said, did I ever lose or reject? I don't regret it because that's how God works. I'm on God's time. So God placed me where I'm supposed to be. So, you know, it was for him. And I'm glad that it, it helped skyrocket his career. So I will always, always respect that man. Yeah, no, that, that's very humble. And But look, I mean, you've had some amazing credits here. So I, I wouldn't look at that as a loss myself, you know? No. Mm -hmm. So let's get to the role that everybody wants to hear about, which is yeah. Argyle and Die Hard. Um, mm -hmm. So Places in the Heart was the film that actually, I guess, got you into the door with Joel Silver, if, am I right? Yeah, it got me reg recognition because it had did very, very well. It did very, very well. I didn't, wasn't aware. I, I, I mean, I didn't know who John Malkovich was. I didn't know who Danny Glover was. Sally Fields, I knew who she was. So... No, yeah, it, it did a it did a lot. And um, so, getting onto this film, playing Argyle, and then you're working with Bruce Willis, who was still, you know, the TV star on Moonlighting, had done Blind Date, had done the movie Sunset, but he hadn't really blown up as a movie star yet. Um, so, what was it like working with him? And you talked about like you guys improvised your scene in the limo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, so there are two parts to this. Die Hard is where I really learned how to how to how to act. It really is, and I'll show you tell you why. That was um that was cool because Jackie Birch, like a pioneer of casting, she and Lee are very good friends, and so they're talking on the phone and. She goes, Lee, you know, I'm looking for this kid and he needs to be like, you know, in a limo, like on a CB radio phone and, and kind of just having fun. And Bruce goes, who's in it? And she's like, well, Bruce Willis, you know, and a couple other people. And and they're, they want to catapult his career, you know, and see if this movie can catapult him into film because that's what you did then, you know, you went from TV and hopefully to film. And so he, Lee goes, okay, I got him. She goes, what do you, what do you mean you got him? She goes, I, I got the kid for you. I got the, the actor for you. She goes, how so? And she goes, DeVorier, he, he goes, DeVorier White. 
And she goes, oh, okay. And she goes, girl, you know, DeVore White, you know, he he was in uh, Places in the Heart with Sally Field and John Malkovich, you know, and Danny Glover. And he's the one that killed her husband. And she goes, oh, yes, yes. And then so he sent her my resume. By that time, if you look on IMDb, by that time, my resume was full of, of a body of work. And so, um, you know, it, it, it was good. And so she was like, OK, I'm just going to send him to Joe Silver and Bruce. And at that time, I didn't know that Joel Silver had produced Lethal Weapon, later on Matrix, and of course, Die Hard. And I loved working with him. And so when that happened, I went and I read with Bruce and uh, Joel. And I went in there and sat down. And I, like you said, I was a, a natural. And so I read the lines and... You know, that was it. I just put a lot of energy into it, like I always have, and then that was it. And before I got home that day at five, I was booked. I was booked. So, um, yeah, it was an experience. And, and it was because uh, of Places in the Heart winning two Academy Awards the year or two before that gave me the, the push and the and the weight to and having Lee and Lee wasn't a producer yet or the powerhouse that he is now. However, he was working on it. <laughs> and so um, yeah, you know, and, and I booked it. Um, now, would you like to hear the story about how I learned how to act, or do you have a question before that? Oh no, let's hear it. Let's hear it. I want to hear this. <laughs> okay, so. I, uh, it was time the first day. It, oh, first of all, okay, I go for wardrobe fitting, right? Mm -hmm. And I've been, always been very direct and assertive. However, I've learned how to have compassion because ego plays a huge part in Hollywood. And I was young and the ego was, it was getting there. You know, I was, you know, I, I start, well, this is after Die Hard. Anyway, so I go to wardrobe and he puts on this suit this ill-fitting suit and the shoes just don't fit or they don't look right. And the jacket was tight under my arms. And, and I go, this doesn't, you know, he goes, okay. The wardrobe fitting goes, okay. And I said, this doesn't feel right. I said, it's tight under the arms and the, the pants are kind of too far up. He goes, oh, we'll fix that. We'll fix that. Anyway, we need to get to Mr. Silver. We need to get to Mr. Silver. He's waiting for you. I said, Okay, so we go over there to Joe Silver's office, beautiful office, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright, I think he had brought the rights to Frank Lloyd Wright or something, and the deco stuff, and the velvet chairs, if you saw them like the 40s and stuff, that was amazing to me, you know, that was amazing, and, and that's when I began to appreciate Frank Lloyd Wright, and I was looking around, I was like, this is cool, this is cool, and these posters of like movies from the 1920s, and all this stuff and and so he the guy the wardrobe guy come on come on and i went in there it, the office where people were waiting to see joel silver and they looked nervous they're like some women had their their hands on their laps and straight up and they looked like they were nervous and i was like why are they nervous and then i hear joel silver um get the fuck out of here you i told you what to do get the fuck out <laughs> And I see this person run out of the, his office and outside, and everybody's like this. And I just wasn't that type of person. You know, I was, well, okay, right <laughs> on, right on. And so um, the, the secretary goes, um, I mean, the assistant goes, uh, Mr. Joel, uh, wardrobe is here with Mr. White. So we go in, and, and he goes, how you doing? He goes, good to see you. And I said, good to see you, man. And he goes, so you like your suit? And I said, actually, it's horrendous. It, it's terrible. And these shoes are just, I wouldn't wear this shit across the street. <laughs> and he laughed. And then he looked at the wardrobe person, and which I wasn't intending to do. He looked at the wardrobe person and he goes, get him a fucking suit that, he, that fits him better, that he likes. Get the fuck out of here. And I'm like, so... 
he ended up getting me a nice suit and mm. some comfortable, nice shoes. Now, that part is, I got that out of the way. So first day on set, I'm like, okay, I, I want to rehearse this. Cause that's what I would do. I, I would just read the lines and just say them, you guys. And and so I said, um, I went over to Bruce's trailer and I rang the buzzer. And by the way, this was like you like we said, this was to catapult his career. Right. You know, they were hopefully that he was going to catapult him. We had no idea what was going to happen. And so uh, back to, I went over to Bruce's trailer and I rang the little doorbell on his trailer. And an assistant comes to the door and says, what can I do for you? And I said, I'm playing our guy. I just wanted to know if Bruce wanted to run the lines. And he goes, she came back and goes, oh, he said he'll be out in a minute. I said, okay. So they all get together. John McTiernan, awful, awesome director. Yeah. Awesome director, Andre, you guys know. And so um, I knew that he was big. I knew that he was big. And so we're in a circle to rehearse and they were going to do my uh, scene with him and one of my first scenes with him. And he goes, okay, so on action, let's go. I'm in tears and he goes, okay, action. And I go, so you're a New York cop and you're going to bring one bag and why bother with that, right? And he looked at me, you guys, and he goes, for a minute, he, he paused and he went, Come here for a second. And he pulled me to the side. He goes, do you understand the elements and the chemistry and the objective of your character? I went, not really. See, I share with you guys. I just grew up going like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't understand what method was and all of this stuff yet. And so he goes, did you read the script? I went, kind of. And he goes, so do you know the story at all? I said, well, yeah, this guy wants to get away from these bad guys. And he goes like that. And then I will not ever forget it. He goes, look. And I said, what? And he goes, he lives in New York. He's a New York cop. And they, his wife, they've separated. So he's flying to LA because he's bringing only one bag. So he's on the hopes of getting back to her, get together with her and happily ever after, because he wants to stay. Do you understand? It was loud. It was loud, you guys. And I mean, it was so loud that he, he like did a Joel Silver move. <laughs> yeah. So he goes, I was such in like a, shock for the first time in my career something like hit me so to the core he went action and I said so you're a New York cop and you're coming to LA with one bag to meet your wife so why bother the pack right that was seen mm -hmm. and then it all began wow. <laughs> that's what it all began <laughs> it was because of John McTiernan that man dude you guys it was such a shock that I had not ever felt anything like that before, ever, ever. And so I just, that's when I was like, I need to learn how to act. Even Places in the Heart, I was drunk when I killed her husband. I was, the character was drunk. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Robert Benton, they had stints, flew down, Sandra flew down a person to show me how to be drunk. Because not that I couldn't do it, they wanted to make sure that I could do it. Mm -hmm. So that was like a little escape, by the way, um, a little like ticket, you know, a little um, Band-Aid. Because uh, they loved the acting. You know, they told me later on, I said, why'd you hire me? And they said, there was just something about you. We were like that kid in L.A. So we flew you to New York. So anyway, moving forward, that's when um, I, you know, got my acting coach, Catlin Adams, who's awesome. You know, Robert De Niro. Lily Tom and they call her, Zoe, they call her like two in the morning, you know, and they go, okay, how do I do this? And then I learned, you guys, I learned what the elements were of an actor. She taught me how to memorize, you know, the, the most uh, kind of easiest, however, very meticulous way to memorize. She showed me how to do 
breathing exercises to learn the elements of your body, like laying on the floor, you know, going from your toes all the way up to your head and even to your face. And she would have me squeeze my face and say, tighten as hard as you can. And she goes, do your face. And I go, then I breathe. So I learned all that stuff, the objectives of a character. What does this character want in this scene? Not in the movie, in this scene, because the scenes are all different. So sure. you're going to have different objectives and still be the same character. And so that's what I loved. You know, you could become the character and the character becomes you. And I learned all that. I learned it. Awesome. So that's the yeah. die <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, another cool. question I got to ask, because sure. every time I think about that film, it's when you and Bruce Willis are getting close to Nakatomi Plaza and you start playing Run DMC's Christmas in the Hollis. Was that song already picked when you guys shot that scene or was that like something like an afterthought? It was it was they had it ready to go. <laughs> they had it ready to go. And I was like, all right. All right. Let's go rock. Let's go rock. Yeah, they had that ready to go. Yeah, because like that's my favorite. Like this is Christmas music. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they had they had that ready to go, which yeah. was great because actors at that at that stage of the game of my development, I was in a position to share with them uh, so calmly and so compassionately that can we uh, get to perhaps listen to some other songs? There was no reason to. Because it it matched the character and him, the chemistry between them and everything. So, no, they chose it. Oh man, because it, it shows. Because uh, what I like about your performance in the movie—I mean, I love the movie—but what I like about your performance is again, you're kind of the coolest character in the movie, but you're a little late to the game in realizing what's happening. And then when you do realize the seriousness of it you have a real reaction, not like, oh, okay, I'll fight, figure a way out. You're like, how the hell do I get out of here? And it's like, that is what, like, that is one of the many things of the movie that, like, I think charms audiences because they're like, that's probably what I would do. I wouldn't be, like, you know, the coolest, you know, just, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll figure this out. They'd be, like, right. freaking out. So that is one of the things that, you know, I personally, and I'm sure most other audience members, love about the film. Yeah. It, it was it was just fun. It was fun. And like I said, there was something that jolted me um, with John McTiernan to take the character uh, more seriously, however, not to ever lose my ambience and my character as myself. Because I was always the jokester in school. You know, I would get like in fifth grade, you know, I got suspended from school because I was always playing jokes. You know, I had the whoopee cushions, the stink stink bombs, the snapping gum, garlic tasting, all those dog poop, cat poop, everything. <laughs> and so I did that. I was always in the ma magician shops in Hollywood getting tricks. I wanted to be a musician, music, magician. And so, um, you know, it was just it was just fun to to be that way. And I guess as a uh, a young guy, it um it was incorporated with my comedic stuff in various parts and and especially that movie. So it worked out. Um, would you say that is one of I know it's the role you get most recognized for, most likely. But I was mm -hmm. also going to ask: is is that a role that has always stayed with you personally also? It got me the most recognition. Does it stay with me? I'm aware that I did a great body of work mm -hmm. uh, and I'm still recognized. You know, I go places. I mean, you know, I was at Trader Joe's the other day and and I walked out and this guy, the, the cashier, comes out and he goes, Argyle? And I turned around and I said, how you doing, man? And, and I'm always very, very honored, you know, when someone, when someone comes up. So what you're asking me is, 
is uh do, do i appreciate it or is that what you're asking me i uh, know I, I it's obvious you appreciate it but i guess like out of all of your roles is okay uh, let me put it in a different way would you say out of all the characters you play is that one of them that is almost the most like your own personality i have multiple personalities <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's one of them because okay. I'm just, I, you know, I, I don't, at this, I, I needed to, to grow spiritually. And we'll talk about that yeah. when Die Hard had happened. I need to really get into who is, and I'm known by day, uh, by the way. And so I need to look at myself and, and go, who is day? What do you appreciate in life? What do you appreciate the value of in your life? Do you value yourself? Do you respect yourself to respect others? And I learned it's not all about me. It's about being there for somebody else. However, to answer your question, there's so many elements, you know, in the career on this journey that I'm still on that die hard. It was because that's that was me. You know, when you saw that was that was me. However, I got into learning who the character was by that time and uh, learning what what was his objective. His objective was to keep poking at this dude because that's how he is. Just poke at him and, and just, uh, what's your name? What's your mother's name? What sign are you? Uh, what favorite city are you from? What's your favorite color? That was the character. And so um, I would say there's there's not one favorite one i'm just being very transparent with you there's not one favorite one because i played so many different characters from the, my childhood till now and i appreciate them all that one probably got me the most recognition also when i was co-starring on head of the class so that's a television show every week live audience so at that point, it depends on pivotal, it depends on what stage you are in your game of acting. Okay. You know, if Die Hard is up right now, it's like, oh, are you in Die Hard? Yep. And then I'm doing Heather Glass with Robin Givens, and it's like every week, you know, and there's, you know, after the show, me, Michael De Lorenzo, Robin, Rain Pryor, you know, there's people waiting. We're we're getting in our cars because they have valet parking for us. And <laughs> All the, the the audience and girls and stuff were outside, you know, and they were, yeah, yeah, yeah. we're like, yeah, yeah. So it's different stages, you know. It's different different stages, different platforms, dude. Okay. So, does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, it does. Right on, right on. <laughs> That's something I also think about with Die Hard, which is very interesting. And this is not a question I wrote down, but. It's probably one of the few movies I could think of at that time where, you know, obviously Bruce Willis being the white hero, all the people that help him out are black. Yourself, Reginald Bell Johnson, you know, all the other people like the, you know, Paul Gleason's character and, of course, uh, Hart Bodger playing the, the cokehead co-worker Bonnie Bedelia are all like, trying almost screwing him over unintentionally even the federal agents so i don't know if that ever kind of like caught your attention between yourself and rental Vell johnson kind of be like the guys who kind of support bruce in that sense not until i reflected on it now that you mentioned it i did say to myself this has ignited uh something that is paying homage to us you know it, it did it, it Reginald you know it was I, I looked at it and I was like that's cool you know that Joel did that I didn't really look at it mm -hmm. in depth until you said it right now and it was a reminder you know that and that's I'm honored to be a part of that so honored because thank you you know you uh, now I reflect it, and I thank you, you know, for bringing that up. Uh, yeah, it's just another gold nugget that's added to the treasure box of Die Hard, and you reminded me of that. So, yeah. Yeah.